Good morning. Good morning. We want to wish all the dads and grandpas happy Father's Day. And we're glad you're here. Special time to be together. Every time we gather together, I just feel like, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to meet again. Thank you, Lord, for being in your house, and thank you for your people. And let's stand and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we could say thank you the whole service, Lord, and it wouldn't be enough. For we all have so much to be thankful concerning you, Lord God, especially for Jesus, Lord God. We ask for your blessing on our time together as we gather, Lord God. We pray that you would give us one heart and one mind and one purpose this morning as a body to praise you and give you thanks, Lord God. We pray, Lord, you would bless our time together as we worship and praise and adore you, Lord May this be a special time, Lord, when we lift our hearts up to you, our hands, or whatever you desire, Lord. A special time of worship, God. And Father, we pray, Father, for our time for the word of God, that you would bless that time, Father. Father, we look to you. May every heart be turned toward you in every way, Lord God. And Father, this morning we want to acknowledge our need for you, God. We need you in our lives 24-7, Lord. Now bless this time, Lord God, and bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Good morning. We're here to worship our Father. So let's just uh, give him our attention this morning. He is, he is good.
Good morning, and welcome to Calvary Chapel this Sunday. Happy Father's Day to you, those of you, and grandfathers. It is a blessing to be in the presence of the one Father that matters the most. Amen. Amen. So I just have a couple of brief announcements. Um, we are continuing to do our services uh, recorded and on the web. So uh, remind people if you come in contact with others about uh, you know, not being here because of the COVID-19 or other reasons that they can still catch those services. We're not doing them live at the moment. We hope to do that maybe some point in the future. Um, but they are, you know, later in the day or the next day available. Um, so you can check that out, calvarychapelclearlake.com. Um, there's links there where you can get services recent and going back, you know, a month or two. Um, and this Saturday, the women's ministry will be uh, coming back together for their Bible study on Saturday. And amen. So we're going to continue our worship and receive an offering at this moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great grace that you give us living in these trouble, trying times, Lord. Lord, sometimes it's just difficult to go out and be amongst other people with their things and, and just reading about all the news about the wars and rumors of wars and the contentions and all the things. You know, make us realize, Lord, that your time is near. And so we choose to seek you, Lord, to come together to worship you, to read your word, to find encouragement and strength in the presence of the Holy One, in Jesus' name.
thank you, Father, that you are always there. We never have to worry about losing you. We can call on your name anywhere, anytime. You're with us. You hear us. You love us.
Blessed be your name, Lord God, worthy of all praise. You alone are our Father. We bow the knee, Lord, to you this morning. the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders and love Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought.
Father, we want to thank you for worship and praise and the preparing of our hearts for your word, Lord God. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would cleanse each one of us, Lord, in a way that only you can wash us, Lord. That we may, Father, hear what you would have for us to know, Lord God. That you would, Father, change our hearts, Lord God, for we know it's only through the word of God that you change us, Lord God. And Father, I'm asking that you would purify me, that, Lord, I'd be a vessel you could pour yourself through completely to. Father, bless your people through the word of God, Lord, and make our hearts attentive to you. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. Just wanted to say this before we go into God's word. There are some people who are staying home because they have the conviction that they need to be at home right now. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You may meet them on the street. Or you may meet them in the store. And they may be shopping. or They have to grocery shop. It's okay. People's convictions are a little bit different for each of us. So don't feel weird that if you see someone, they're not here right now. They, they're waiting to get home. And there's some people who are more susceptible. They have different heart problems. They have different things that go on in their bodies. And so... We need to just, when they get here, we need to encourage them. And we see them out there, we need to encourage them and love them and, and pray for them. And for us, we, you know, we feel a little more comfortable. I know, I, I feel more comfortable. And you do too. But it doesn't mean that you're any more spiritual or more holy or more closer to God than anybody else. Okay? We just are blessed in that sense of being together. And it's awesome, isn't it, to be together? Okay, today we are going to change gears again because we are in the book of Luke, but we are, we're going to get away from the book of Luke just for one week, and we're going to go to the book of Genesis because of Father's Day. So let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, it says this, and you all know the story real well. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him 
and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go in yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he said, laid on it Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and two of them went together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and he said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there, and he placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, and he said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on this lad, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thickets by its horns. So Abraham went, and he took the ram, and he offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. And he said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. And he said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants. As the sands of heaven and as the sands which is on the earth or the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed is the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Sometimes when we look at the scripture or we look at the word of God, we think especially on special times like this, Father's Day. Women can think, okay, Pastor, now's the really time to get them. And it's funny because when I started to prepare this teaching, I said to the Lord, what do you want me to teach on, God? What is your will for the men today? And I had that same mentality what is it for the men that you have for them today, God? And this is what the Lord spoke to me. My word is for all my people. Amen. This is one where we're going to point to men on a lot of things, but a lot of the things in here are for every single Christian. In the book of Psalms, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is a light for all of his people. So what am I saying? I'm saying this. Don't negate because it's Father's Day and it's somewhat about that for dads about letting God work in your heart. I want to remind you. It is the only obstacle, or I'm sorry, the only object that God has given us to change your heart is the word of God. And this morning, you came here to hear from God, and you came for God to change your heart. Amen? That's what God's desire is. So let him do that. Today, we celebrate Father's Day. Father's Day is one of the days of the year we express our thanks and our love to our dads and our fathers. I say dad and father's day because I believe you can be a dad and not be a father. 
In other words, you can nurture and love a child and be a dad to them and not be their biological father. And that's pretty prevalent today, isn't it? It's called mixed families. Now, the effects of positive and continual relationship with one's father has been found to be associated with a good self-concept, a high self-esteem, a high self-confidence in personal and social interaction, high moral maturity, greater internal control, and higher career aspirations. It reduces the rate of unwed teen pregnancy. Fathers who are affectionate, nurturing, and actively involved in child rearing are more likely to have well-adjusted children. This is just some of the statistics. So how important is it that fathers are involved in their children's life? According to the Bible, it's really, really, really important. I have more influence, and you have more influence on your children than anybody else, as we will see this morning. Listen to this. Between 50 and 60% of families do not have fathers in their homes. If this is true, where are the fathers? Where are the men in their children's lives? This means that there are many single parent homes and the father is the one missing. Now, same thought. What is the greatest gift you can give your father if he was a bad dad? A bad father. I believe the greatest gift today is forgiveness. But with giving that gift, you're giving yourself a gift also. Because as you forgive somebody, you're released from what holds you in bondage. I met a man the other day. I was walking my dog. And he offered me a walking stick. I had a walking stick already. And he says, here, here's a really nice one. Just can, you know what kind of wood this is? I said, no, I don't know wood. I happen to have a manzanita walking stick. And he gave me this kind of wood. I don't even know what kind it is still. He told me what kind it was. He said, you can get this down to a beautiful stick here. You can have this. And I said, oh, thank you. And so he started talking to me. And he started saying these things, how he had a problem with this and a problem with that. He's been a Christian for 20 years. And he was just spewing things out. And this is what the Lord said to me. You tell him that he has a serious problem with unforgiveness. And I said, you know, you got a serious problem with unforgiveness, man. Because I know I do. I think I'm stupid. <laughs> and what do you say to a person like that? Yes, you are. I didn't say that, but I wanted to. <laughs> but I began to minister to him about forgiveness. And he said this to me. First of all, I said, you're full of bitterness, anger, resentment. You're full of it all, man. And you're poisoned, and you won't forgive well, he doesn't deserve forgiveness. I said, neither do you. I said, if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. I just can't do it, man. He said, maybe I need to get reborn or saved again. I said, that's not the problem, man. The problem is you won't let go. You won't forgive. Have any of you ever been there? All of us have somewhat, haven't we? But I think the greatest gift that we can give our dads, because I don't think any of us had perfect dads, is to forgive them. Our, our dads who weren't even in our lives. There are people who have unforgiveness concerning their dads because they were never in their lives. And it's affecting them badly. Now, there's a couple of things I'd like to look at covering this same thought. Concerning dads and the effect they had on our lives. What good came out of our lives concerning our fathers raising us? 
Some of it was good and some of it was bad, if we're honest. But in God's grace, God uses both. The good and the bad. God's done that in my life. Let me ask you another question. What legacy did your fathers leave you? I want to give you a few that my dad left me. Many of you can relate to this, especially if you were raised in my era or my time. My dad taught me how to work. He would never let me be lazy. When I was seven years old, I remember we lived in a two-story house down in Daly City, which is by San Francisco, for those you don't know. And it was raining out. And while it was raining, my dad was out with my two older brothers, three older brothers were up on top of the roof, and they were fixing the roof with tar because it was leaking. And my dad says to me, I'm seven years old on a two-story house. He said, get up here, you're helping. And I'm up there on the roof, and it's raining. And I went inside afterwards because I said, you know, I can't help. I'm seven years old. I don't know. I mean, I even had that kind of sense of I don't know, uh, uh, no help to nobody. I need to go back inside. Well, I went back inside. My dad chased me back outside. My point is, is, is that my dad really taught me that you're not going to sit there and watch TV or play checkers or do whatever you're doing. You're going to go out and help just like everybody else is going to go out and help. So I learned a wonderful work ethic from my dad. Now, I taught that same thing to my children. I taught my children to work. My oldest two sons and my youngest two sons. I taught them to work. Let me say this to you, and please listen. We live in a society that teaches our children to expect everything and for them not to do any kind of work. And what happens is when they get to a certain age and they get to a certain time in their life and when it's time to work, they can't because they've never been trained by their parents to work. The greatest gift you can give God, or give your kids is a relationship with Christ, an example, as we will see in a moment. I believe, not on the top of it, but real close, in the middle, the most, one of the most important things you can teach your children is to work. Amen. And it has to be taught. So one of the legacies I learned from my dad was to work, and to work hard. I also learned that I was to take care of the needs of my family. My father was a longshoreman. In other words, he worked on the docks in San Francisco. He worked there for 38 years in a row. He worked night crew. Horrible night crew. But he has 14 kids to take care of. And I'm sure at times he thought, I hate this job. Now, if you've been working a job, how many have said this in your own mind in the last year? I don't really like what I'm doing that much. This is a pain. And have you felt that way? I don't have to take this, but this is what you've, after you've said that, this is what you've said to yourself, I have to do this. I have no choice. I have a family I have to take care of. There's certain things I have to do no matter what. And so we swallowed the bullet, so to say, no, or swallowed our pride. This is my, what my dad had to do, and this is one of the things he taught me. I learned from my parents to never quit, no matter what. Don't ever give up, no matter what. Keep going. My dad told me one day, he said, and it just so happened that we were outside, and the garbage man was coming by. In those days, if you were my age, you remember that the garbage man would walk, and he would have a garbage can. How many remember that? Raise your hand if you remember that. Some of you don't remember, but let me, look at, let me show you what happened. They had these big round cans, about so big, and they had a big hook on it that they carried on their shoulder, and the garbage truck would come by, and they'd come dump it in, and then they would get two or three garbage cans filled, and then they'd go dump it in again, and the truck driver would go in there, and the big 
dump truck, so to say. That's what the garbage men did in those days. It was hard work. And so he was passing by the garbage truck and the garbage man, and my dad said, even if you're a garbage man, you be the best garbage man there is. I didn't want to be no garbage man. <laughs> but this is part of the legacy that my father left me. And I must say that my dad was not an easy dad in so many ways, especially to love. He was mean and gruff, and he was abusive physically. Not sexually in any way, but physically. But I want to say this, God used this for good in my life. I learned what not to do from my father in many aspects. And I call that my part of my legacy too. I learned not to be abusive with my words. I don't scream at my, my wife in any way. I don't scream at my children. I'm not saying I never get upset. That's not what I'm saying. All of us sometimes get upset. I've learned not to hit my children with things that you can get close to or grab, any obstacle. I've learned not to abuse my wife, but to truly love her. God taught me that. Now, because I've thought what kind of legacy my father gave me, I have to think about my legacy. What kind of legacy do I want to leave with my children and my grandchildren? My children, more or less, have my legacy. They're older now. Hard to believe my kids are in the 40s. Unbelievable. And my young ones in their late 20s. I've thought about this legacy that I want to leave my children and grandchildren. And I pray and that I leave them a legacy that is a godly legacy. One that is loving and giving of self. One that serves God and people and not self-centered. Now, it is not easy to be a father if one does it right. It's one of the most demanding gifts of God. Notice what I said. It is one of the most demanding gifts of God. To be a parent, literally, is a gift from God. And God has to equip you to be the parent that he desires. It'll cost you your life. It never ends. It's like the ever-ready bunny. You're always going, going, going. And just when you think your children are gone and that's done serving and everything else, you get a short break and then come the grandkids. We had them this weekend. They're so wonderful. Grandchildren are so awesome. There's nothing like them. They're loving. They're kind. They're pure. They, most of them love God. They start talking about God right away. And when they leave, hallelujah. It's both. It's both. You know, I thought of what is the greatest blessing from my children. I was thinking about bringing the cards they sent me today and reading them to you because it, it was a 100% blessing for me. But I also want you to know it is our relationship and our love for one another, me and my children. And there's nothing like that kind of bond between a dad, a mom, their children, their grandchildren. It is our relationship with God and our great connection that we have together. It is our caring and our knowing we will always be for one another. And like I said, my grandson said, said to me this weekend, he said, Papa, we're going to be in heaven forever and ever and ever together. I can't wait to put my arms around Jesus, he said to me. You talk about wanting a good legacy like that? Nothing like it. Now, 
What does God want us to be and teach our children and grandchildren as dads and papas? What legacy can we leave behind? We can see a lot of them in Abraham. The first one is, we as fathers are to teach our children to love. When I say love, I mean unconditional love, and I mean God's love. The love is not doing what they necessarily want, but what is best for them. That's not easy as a a parent, is it? Paul describes this love as agape love. It is a godly love, and it's the only place in the Greek that is mentioned, and it's in the Bible. That's the only place it is, period, nowhere else. This is the one that God originates and that God puts in our hearts. In Romans chapter 5, it says that God, when you became a Christian, when you became born again, that God spread his love abroad in your heart so I can love. And this is the love that God wants us to come out of our lives. And this is something that I have to teach my children and my grandchildren. Now, this kind of love goes against natural human inclination. It is a giving, selfless, expecting nothing in return kind of love. Paul described this love in 1 Corinthians 13, but it's short and powerful. And there's five little points I want to share with you because I think it's important. First of all, it says love suffers a long time. Our modern throwaway society encourages us to get rid of people in our lives who are difficult to get along with. Whether they are friends, family, or acquaintances. Yet the attitude runs in complete contrast to the love described by Paul. True love puts up with people who would easier be easier to give up on. This is the kind of love we're supposed to teach our children. Dads, moms. Let's look at the second part. Love does not envy. If our love is directed toward others, We will rejoice in the blessing that receives rather than desiring those blessings for ourselves. Fundamentally, the selfless love that God calls us to does not involve pride or glory. Fundamentally, it does not parade itself and is not puffed up. In fact, true love does not seek its own. If we truly love others, we will set aside our own plans, agendas, and entitlements for the good of others or one another. This is something as we are going to go through this, that you cannot do this in your own ability. You can't love this way. It's impossible. God never asks you to love this way in your own strength and your own ability. I'll tell you, if you try to do this on your own, you are not going to make it. You're going to quit in a matter of a short period of time. Because there's going to be such an opposition that you cannot accomplish this in yourself. It is through dependency on God and God working through you that enables you to do this. And this is something that has to be taught to you and taught to your children. That's how it works. Let's look at another part that Paul speaks about. Love is not provoked. That is, love is not easily angered or sensitive. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you easily angered? Do you easily get ticked off? Maybe this morning you got ticked off. Maybe you're really sensitive. There are times in our lives that I believe that we go through sensitive times. We're more sensitive. We get offended real easy. Have you noticed those times? I think we all go through them, don't we? And let me give you the antidote. I know that this is about talking about love. Let me give you the antidote that the Bible speaks about. is literally dying to yourself. Paul made this statement that I die daily to myself. That myself, what I want, what I feel, what I think, the Bible says I'm to crucify that daily. It's not a comfortable thing. It's not easy to die to myself. I want to do certain things. I want to eat certain things. I want to act certain way. I don't think that's right. I'm my opinion. Oh, my gosh. And it goes on and on and on, doesn't it? 
And God said, that's one of my biggest problems. That's one of your biggest problems also. You see, I have to die to self, my will. We see today in our society that there are a lot of those young people who do not want to do this and any thought. They're not Christian, first of all. They can't do it. It's not in their heart in any way. But they're totally rebellious against any kind of authority or anything. Totally opposite of what God says. And that's not what we want our children. But we're going to see in a moment that role models. They're saying, science is saying literally, a lot of the problem that's going on in our children today is they have poor, horrible examples at home. That's heavy. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me backtrack again. So love is not provoked. Paul gives two more in describing love. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. The godly love described in Corinthians has nothing to do with evil, but has everything to do with what is right and true. It believes all things and hopes all things. This does not mean that love is blind or naive. When we love, we may recognize problems and failures in people, but we do not lose faith in the possibility of what God may make them into. Love never gives up, knowing that God has, can change lives for the better. You know, sometimes when I look at the people come to the meals and stuff, I look at them and I think, they've had a hard life. Things have been tough for them. But my thoughts usually go to this place of saying, but if they would give God a chance, no matter how bad they are, no matter what's in their life, no matter what controls them, no matter what they've done, God will give them a new beginning and God can set them free. And he can. And then the last one, Paul, describing this love that we're to teach our children. Love endures all things. Love accepts any hardships or rejections and continues unabated to build up and encourage. The love described by Paul means determining what is best for one another and then doing it. This is the kind of love that God showed to us. So that's the first thing, and I think it's one of the most important by far. Let's look at the second one. Fathers are to teach their children the scripture. Don't even raise your hand for a second, but if I was to ask you this question, how many of you read the scripture to your children this last week? Well, I know some of you probably say, well, I didn't, I, because I don't have my children. My children are gone, and that's okay. That's good. They're gone. They, they've left the nest. You've been set free. <laughs> but this is one thing that God desires for us to do. Listen to what Deuteronomy 6 says. All these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and they shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you raise up. That means you're supposed to talk about God concerning your children. This passage provides a central theme of Deuteronomy, the whole book. It sets a pattern that helps us relate the, to the word of God to our daily life. We are to love God, think constantly about his commandments, teach his commandments to our children, and to live each day by the guidelines in his word. God emphasized the importance of parents teaching the Bible to their children. The church is great to teach your children some things, but that doesn't escape concerning your responsibility as a parent, because the Bible says you are, and I emphasize, you are to teach your children the scripture. Let's look at the third one. Fathers are to train their children in applying the scripture. Uh-oh. When I first started looking at this scripture and preparing for it, this is what came to my mind. Monkey see, monkey do, monkey act just like you. I mean, that pretty sews it up pretty well, doesn't it? 
In the book of Hebrews, it speaks about this. And it speaks about literally applying the word of God to their lives. See, in the Old Testament, they lived this every single day. It was lived out. And this is what the, the Bible teaches us, that we are to teach our children that the word of God is the word of God, and they're supposed to apply it to every circumstance and every situation in their lives. So let me ask you this question. As parents, as grandparents, when your children come to you, your grandchildren come to you and say, what do you think about this? Because my grandchildren, they come to me and they ask me this. What do you think, Papa, about this? And this is what I say to them. Here's what God's word says. Here's how you're supposed to handle this. This is how it works. If I don't, I'm not helping my children. I'm not guiding them and protecting them and teaching them what God says about life because they're going to handle life. If they don't, you don't give them the wisdom and the counsel of the word of God, they're going to handle their life just like the world does. And look at the world today, beloved. If you think this is wonderful out here and you want them to be part of this, look and see where it's at. I don't want my children or grandchildren. As you know, my oldest grandson is getting ready to go to college. And I prayed and prayed and prayed that he wouldn't go to certain colleges because I was scared of those colleges. And God did change his heart. My point is, it's because... They can go to college and they're accepted by college. Doesn't mean that's the one for them or God wants them there. So we need to be very careful. Let's look at the fourth one. Teach your children to trust God. In the Old Testament, most of you know the story of the Red Sea parting. Remember? Most of you remember God doing miraculous things in the Old Testament. And when God would do a great thing, God would say to him, I want you to build a memorial. A memorial was, at least at times, they would get 12 stones and stack them up, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And then God said to them, when your children ask, what did God do so great? That memorial will remind you that God parted the Red Sea. And how these people were after them and trying to destroy them and kill them. Here's what God did. God is worthy to be trusted. In your own personal life, God wants you to teach by your example and by words that God is worthy. Let me ask you this question and think about it. Has God done any memorial in your life? Has God done anything supernatural that only God could do? Has he done that in your life sometime or another? I'm sure he has. But what about recently? Has God recently done something supernatural that you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe he did that. How many of you caught the coronavirus? Don't even raise your hand. Not one of you did. And I bet you you prayed and asked God, make sure I'm protected, God. And how about relatives? There's nobody that I know of in, in my life or people that I've ever heard of in the sense of that I know personally that have the coronavirus that we've been praying for. Isn't that something wonderful? I think it is. I believe we need to teach our children Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Listen to what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. What a promise by God. Fifthly, fathers are to seek God's will for their children. Now listen to this one. This is really important. Let me read to you what Matthew 20, verse 21 and 22 says. Then the mother of Zebedee's son came to him with her sons kneeling down and asking something for him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant these two sons of mine, sit on your right and on your left in your kingdom. In other words, what she said to Jesus, I want my boys up in front. 
in front of everybody. I want them to be the best. Mother of James and John asked Jesus to give his son special positions in the kingdom. Parents naturally want to see their children positioned in his kingdom. Parents naturally want to see their children promoted and honored. But this desire is dangerous if it calls them to lose sight of God's specific will for their children. God may have a different work in mind, not as glamorous, but just as important. Thus, parents' desire for their children's advancement must be held in check as they pray for God's will to be done in their children's life. Did you hear that, beloved? What that says is this. You want to make sure as a parent that you push your children toward God's will. What does God want for your life? Not toward what I want for my children's life or what I think they should be up in front or be this or be that. Not that. You're in trouble if you do that. You want God's will in their life. And some of them are different, but just as important as any others. No different. It's like the calling that God has on your life and God has on my life. Each of you have a calling on their life and they're just as important. None is more imp less important. If it's God's will, it's God's will. Let's look at the sixth one. Fathers are to be good role model models for their children. In other words, I'm supposed to be a godly example. Beloved, our actions speak louder than our words. This is especially true in the home. Children learn values, morals, and priorities by observing how their parents act and react every day. If parents exhibit a deep reverence for and dependency on God, the children will catch that attitude also. Let them see your reverence for God. Teach them right living by giving worship an important place in your family and by reading the Bible together. I can't tell you how important is your example as a man, as a dad, as a mom. I've read different articles concerning what's happening in our world today. And they're saying so many different effects. It's unbelievable the effects on our children because of the broken homes, because of the bad examples of home. It's unbelievable what's happening, they're saying, concerning the effects of children. Seventhly, fathers are to be willing to sacrifice. Every parent learns very quickly when that baby is born, life is on hold. Have you noticed that? Do you remember that? From that point on comes sacrifice. For some people, sometimes men more, that's a dirty word. That they feel that it should, they shouldn't have to sacrifice. Or that's the woman's job. That's not what the Bible teaches. And that's not what God says. We are all, as parents, both, to sacrifice. Just in case you forgot what that word means, Webster described it as this. The act of offering the life of a person or an animal or some object to propitiation or a homage to a deity. The act of giving up, destroying, permitting injury to, or foregoing something valued for the sake of something, having a more pressing calm. Our claim, I'm sorry. So our children are, are more important than, what, than our personal lives. That's what he's saying. We as fathers must be willing to sacrifice because we love our children and because that is part of love. I want you to listen to this true story. True story. It is said that Cyrus, the founder of the Persian Empire, once had captured a prince and his family. When they came before him, the monarch asked the prisoner, what will you give me if I release you? The prince said, half of my wealth. 
And if I release your children, everything I possess, and if I release your wife, your majesty, I will give myself. Cyrus was so moved by this devotion that he freed them all. As they returned home, the prince said to his wife, wasn't Cyrus a handsome man? With a look of deep love for her husband, she said to him, I didn't notice. I could only keep my eyes on you, the one who was willing to give himself for me. Is that an awesome story or what? Sacrifice, beloved. Eighth, the fathers are to teach their children the fear of the Lord. That word literally means to reverence God. To hold, have a holy awe of God. Ninth, the fathers are to teach their children to be humble before their God. Here's a very important one. Brothers and sisters, we are to be people who are humble. I want to remind you what that word is. Because if we aren't humble, our children aren't going to be humble. To have our showing a consciousness of one's defects or shortcoming. Not proud, not self-assertive, modest, low in condition, rank or position, lowly and pretentious. To Abraham was God's chosen. But you do not see pride nor do you see it in his son Isaac. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Can you imagine if God resists somebody? If God resists, they're not going very far. They're not going anywhere. As I learn to be humble, I can teach it to my children. Also, the world will not teach them humility. They'll teach them the opposite. Many parents teach their children pride and don't even realize it. You're the best, man. You've got to be the best. There's nobody better than you. And I'm not saying to not encourage your kids to do their best. Did you hear what I said? To do their best. But there's a difference between doing their best and saying, I am the best. This thought of getting our children to believe that they can do anything is not healthy for our children. They can do anything that God calls them to do. I agree on that. But I have found it to be true that our kids can't do anything. There are certain people that are gifted in doing certain things, and they can do that. There are certain people that are so musically blessed and gifted that they can play the guitar and play 10 instruments. I can't even play the whistle. <laughs> All I'm saying is we have to be very careful in telling our children they can do anything because they can't. The 10th one, and we're almost done we are to teach our children to serve God. We teach them to work at school, to work hard at getting good at sports. But when it comes to serving God, I believe this is definitely one of the biggest downfalls that we have concerning families, concerning Christianity, really. I believe if we want them to serve God, we ourselves must be examples in this. But I must ask a question to all of you this morning, and that is, do you even want your children to serve God? When I was growing up, one of the greatest things that a person can be was a doctor, a priest, a pastor. Everybody wanted their children to be something like this that served people. That was a highly respected position. And nowadays... The question must come to us as parents. Do we really want our children to be serving God in any way? Or do I want them to serve 
Right? We will see in a moment other gods. I want to remind you that the Bible teaches that we are to serve God, every single one of us. That God gives us gifts and talents to serve the kingdom of God. And if you say, well, I'll, I serve God my own way, you're not serving him. Don't deceive yourself by convincing yourself that what I do is the way God wants me to do it. It's unbiblical. It's not true. God does not say, you serve me the way you desire or in whatever capacity you decide. God says, I choose what you will do for my kingdom. I choose that, God says. Now, you are teaching your children to serve a God by your example. Which God are you teaching your children to serve? The Bible speaks about this in the time of Joshua. God had blessed them. Everything was going well for them. And Joshua made a statement. He's getting ready to die real soon. And he says, guess what? You guys are serving different gods. But as for me and my household, I'm going to serve the Lord. And so are my children. During that time, there were three different gods that some of God's people decided to serve. Moloch was one of them. It was called the god of pleasure. They would offer their children to be burned by Moloch. So this was the god of pleasure, number one, and there's two more we'll talk about in just a moment. The word pleasure means to be pleased, feelings, enjoyment, delight, satisfaction, one wishes, or one wills, or choice. What is pleasure? A thing that gives delight or satisfaction, gratification of the senses, sensual satisfaction, amusement, fun, to give pleasure to. So this is the word described in what's the God they were serving. Now, there are many who serve this God today. They will probably never admit it to others, but they still do this, and this is still true. They have to be constantly entertained or planning a weekend, doing something or watching a game or coaching this or coaching that or going to this mall or to a party. But what they don't realize is that they are serving the God of Moloch. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? The second god is mammon, which means wealth, and is called unrighteousness because of the abuse of riches in which most frequently and they're right, use, they're using them right. We are to use our wealth for God's kingdom, not for our own. When we use our wealth for God's kingdom, we store our riches in heaven. Beloved, there are many who serve the god of mammon. They'll work hour after hour to gain wealth, which brings power, or may bring power. They will sacrifice their families, reputation, and life to get money. Mammon is their God, whether they admit it or not. Then the third God is Baal. This is a God of intellect. They have to know so much. They know more than God, so they think. They continue to learn, and their learning turns them into ignoramuses. Beloved, learning is good as long as what we learn does not contradict the truth of God and his word. I'm going to say that to you again. Learning is good as long as we learn and it does not contradict the truth of God and his word. So let me ask you this question. Which God are you teaching your children to serve by example? Which God have we taught our children the most important to serve? As parents, you are serving 
one of these gods are the true God, and you're teaching your children to serve those gods. Which one? I mentioned earlier that the things that God calls us to do as a parent, as a father, as a mother, as a papa or grandpa or grandma, the ability is given to us by the Holy Spirit to do that. The enablement comes from God. It can't be on your own. God wants you to understand that though God calls you to do these things, he enables you to do them as you depend on God for that ability and that strength. This is what God wants from us as fathers. And there are, and we're not going to go through it, but there are men who were bad fathers would not correct their children, would not do what God's word said, and their children ended up destroying their lives. Samuel was one. You would think, Samuel, a great prophet, a man of God, and he was 100%, sold out from just about birth. But he wouldn't correct his children. He wouldn't do what he needed to do as a father, just like Eli, the high priest, no different. I believe one of the greatest accomplishments we can have in our life is knowing we are godly fathers. I've thought this for myself personally, and it stayed the same for a long time, and it's still the same. What, did it, what is it that I want for my children? I want my children to know God and walk with God. I want my children to love God and my grandchildren. I want them in in the will of God and to be filled with the Spirit of God. I desire that they'll be ready for Jesus' return and what he's going to bring and what he's going to allow because we are in those days. I don't care what they accomplish. If they accomplish and they're in God's will, I'm okay with that. But I don't care what they have. I don't care about any of that stuff. The most important thing for my children is to follow God and walk with God. But I have some influence on that by my example. I repeat myself, I know. Now, we're almost done. When the archaeologists were digging in the ruins of Nineveh, they came upon a library of plaques containing the law of the realm. One of the laws read, in effect, that anyone guilty of neglect would be held responsible for the result of the neglect. If you fail to teach your children to obey, if you fail to teach them to respect the property rights of others, you are not he, you and not he, are responsible for the result of the neglect. That's heavy, Pastor. I mean, you're trying to make me feel guilty? No, not at all. I'm trying to convict you. Convince you. There's a difference. That you need to do what God called you to do and be who God called you to be. It's important. You infect a lot of other people. Last thing, Joseph Stalin not a popular guy, wrote this. America is like a healthy body, and its existence is threefold. It's patriotism, it's morality, and it's spiritual life. If we can undermine these three areas, America will collapse within. Let me ask you, Did you hear that? Do you see it happening and what's happening in our nation? All of these things are happening and they're collapsing. And they should never collapse in the body of Christ, in God's people and God's family. God promises. Listen to what he says and I'm going to end it, I promise. He says this. He gives a story of building their house on a rock. 
and the storms of life come. And that's what we're going through right now, storms of life. And the big winds came, and the house stood. I'm on purposely saying that first. The one that was built on the rock is the one that heard the word of God and applied the word of God. God makes a promise for every person who applies the word of God to their family. To whatever they do, God says, the storms are going to come. But I promise you, you're going to be standing steady when it's done. When this is all over, you and I will still be standing if you're applying the word of God to your life. But let's go back to the second part of that teaching that Jesus gives. But he is built on the sand. When the storms came, and they're going to come in everybody's life, great was the fall of that house. Do you remember what Jesus said about that house, one built on the sand? It's the one that didn't apply the word of God. They heard it, and they didn't apply the word of God to their lives. You see, God knows what he's doing. He doesn't make no mistakes. When we first started this teaching, we asked God to work in your heart. We asked God to change you in some way or another, to enlighten you, to speak to you. That's what God does through the word of God. It shouldn't make you angry or get you upset. You shouldn't have said that. I don't like what he said. If you need something to be said, you need something to be said. Accept it. Let it change you and let the Spirit of God work. And let me tell you, when you leave this place and you go to your home, because we talked a lot about home and how to be an example and everything, you are going to be reminded. I don't even have to say anything anymore, really. You're going to be reminded because the Holy Spirit's going to work in you and say, hey, wait a minute, do you remember this? Uh, well, I kind of heard it. Really wasn't interested in it, but... The Holy Spirit will convict you because he loves you and he wants his life to be your life. That's a difference. Father, we want to thank you for the word of God today, Lord. We want to thank you for the truth of it, Lord God. And Father, we want to be the dads you want us to be. We want to be the papas you want us to be, the grandpas. We want to be the grandmas, Lord. Whatever you want us to be, we want to be them, Lord God. And we know that it's through your equipping, your ability, Lord God. We can't be these, Lord God. We can't love this way. We can't teach this. We can't be the example you want us to be without the Holy Spirit and your enablement, Lord God. So this morning, we surrender our hearts and our wills and our lives to you, God. You work in us, Lord God. And you show us, Lord, what you want us to do, Lord. And Father... May we teach our children your ways, your thoughts, Lord. Father, I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives in us. I want to thank you for your enablement, Lord God. And I want to thank you, Lord, that you love us that much. That, Lord, you work in us. And you even, Father, correct us and chasten us, Lord. So, Father, may your people receive your blessing today, Lord God. And Father, may you be glorified through this. In Jesus' precious name we pray, Father. Amen. The gospel, the good news. It's important that we understand it's much more than just going to church. It's about having a relationship with God. And that starts through Jesus and Jesus only. The Bible teaches that one must be born again. For all of us are separated from God because of sin. That mediator, who is Jesus, comes in and mediates for us that sin, removes that sin. It's only through Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches how to become born again. You must believe Jesus came down from heaven, that he died and he arose. You must believe you're a sinner. You must ask Christ to come into your heart and live. And the Bible says... He will. You must ask God to forgive your sins. The Bible says when that happens, you become born again. God will never reject anyone. Never reject anyone. And remember, we all come to God as sinners, saved by grace. 
Well, if you've never done that, do that this morning. Don't leave it here without Christ. Let us stand this morning. If you need prayer, we'll have people up here. Tony, would you come up, please? And I'll be up here on this side. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray for you. If you want to come up, the worship team's going to play some songs. If you want to come up to the altar and pray, please do. May God richly bless you as you look to him. Be wise out there. There's a lot of things going on. Stay close to our God. He loves you. God bless you. Have a great day. And happy Father's Day again. I give you my soul